Hello and welcome to the Kick in the Creatives podcast, hosted by myself, Sandra Busby, and my fellow creative, Tara Roskell, offering you interviews, inspiration, motivation, and a gentle prod in the right direction. And for lots more information, challenges, and other useful tools to help you get creating, you can go to www.kickinthecreatives.com. And of course, this is where you can also find today's show notes. Enjoy the show. Today, Tara and I chat to Carrie Brummer. Carrie was originally an art teacher in school. She started a blog about art in her spare time and discovered that people all over the world wanted to learn to draw and paint. That blog later became known as artiststrong.com, where Carrie formed a community and taught people to draw through her online courses. She really was a pleasure to chat to. Enjoy. So, Carrie, thank you, first of all, so much for joining us today. We've been looking forward to talking to you. I'm really happy to be here. I loved chatting with you both during the other chat we had, and so this will be fun to keep the conversation going. Oh, yeah, that was the uh, Facebook chat, wasn't it? And it was our first ever Facebook Live, which um, was quite nerve-wracking. <laughs> yes, and you guys were both wonderful on video. Oh. <laughs> so first of all, can you tell us uh, when your creative journey began? Did you come from a creative background? I can't remember a time in my life where I wasn't making something. Mm. I have a mother who studied art in college, uh, but she didn't end up having any career with it. She ended up marrying my father and having kids and kind of just choosing the stay-at-home mom path. But she was always making and exploring different materials. I watched her learn how to weave baskets, fix chairs that had, I forgot what it's called, but the the same kind of like weaving principles where it's the um, kind of dried reed that you have to fix. the Like, like a wicker. Yes, yeah. Uh, she would paint on glass in reverse, um, where you had to layer and kind of paint in reverse, typically to what we're used to with like acrylic or oil so that you'd flip the glass over and have this lovely little, you know, painting of an animal, like a raccoon or I just, anything this woman wanted to explore or try, she did. And that was, that was just so, she didn't say anything about it, but it was modeled. And, and I think that just always made me really excited to explore different art materials. So did she teach you as she was doing it as well? Uh, if I showed interest, she would show me different tips or tricks. Uh, we did a lot of coloring together today. She even sometimes rolls her eyes when we talk about coloring. And she's like, I did so much coloring with you. It was terrible. <laughs> Just because of the pure uh, kind of persistent desire and request uh, for the activity. Um, she taught me how to embroider. Uh, which actually now influences my current work today, which was a long path in between. But um, I did learn cross stitch and embroidery from her and then some beading kind of tricks that she used to decorate ornaments for Christmas and then even embellish clothing or fabrics. So what about school then? Did you do art at school? Did you go on and study art at college? So I had this battle about whether it was okay for me to go to art school and whether I could actually have a career in art. So while it was very encouraged in my family life to explore and play with material, you know, my mom was the creative and my dad was the very practical business oriented guy who was like, well, how are you going to make a living from this? And so while he loved my art making and was very supportive of me exploring it, uh, I had that persistent question in the back of my head. So even though I took every art class I could, even throughout high school, it was this like, I'm not sure if I should go. And when I was speaking with a counselor in my high school who was helping me apply to different schools, um, it was kind of the year before we had to apply and we were talking about goals. And as a senior in my my high school program, I had the choice to sign up for a VoTech program where I'd actually be able to spend half the school day working on my portfolio. Wow. And I was super excited about the opportunity and my mom was totally on board. But when I spoke to the counselor, he literally looked at me, stopped, stared and said, you're too smart to do that. And I was so, and can still be driven by pleasing figures of authority that he shut me down so quickly. It never occurred to me that I could argue against his stance. 
So I didn't do that program and I took a bunch of academic courses my senior year and still took some art classes, but I ended up uh, choosing a liberal arts college in the States. And I don't know that, I think the programs are a bit different in the UK. So a liberal arts university has like one or two years of all kinds of different subject matter that you're exposed to. And then the last two years, you choose a focus of study. So initially, I was like, I'm going to be a psychology major. I was finding all these other topics, but I came back to my art and ended up choosing studio art and art history as a combined degree. Well, you seem to um, enjoy a variety of subjects because having visited your website, it's quite obvious you you've been doing a lot of things in your life and you mentioned embroidery earlier um you've obviously sort of enjoyed quite a lot of different mediums as well so is there a particular one that you enjoy most and what led you to that you know that's such a hard question for me Mm. I I don't I feel like if I choose one I'm somehow breaking my allegiance or respect for all the materials I use (laughs) Uh, so you know I for the longest time painting to me in general. And I initially worked with oils and then switched to acrylics in my adulthood. But painting in general was a medium where I thought that's that's what it means to be an artist when I was younger. If you can paint, that means you've, you know, you've done it. So that drives kind of a lot of my decision making and I think gives me some affirmation in terms of my personal definition of making art and my goals around art making. So what subjects are you drawn to? Is it people, landscapes, or what do you like? I've always been drawn to people. And again, I think that has a lot to do with my personal definition of art coming from childhood and what I thought meant it meant to be a good artist. And I saw that my parents were always really impressed if I could capture likeness in portraits or do something that looked like from life or from photo reference. And for me, faces felt like this ultimate challenge. And I just loved it. And it always kept me challenged. I never felt bored from it or like I'd just have it all figured out and it would, you know, there was just this constant feeling of motivation and drive to keep exploring the face. So I would say that's kind of my primary focus now. Would you say your style's changed um, from when you sort of started getting serious about your art to where you are now? Oh, totally, completely, a complete difference in my work. I've always worked with portraiture. But then I had a period of time where, again, kind of battling those inner critic demons, wondering if that's what I should be doing and is it sellable and all these kinds of questions we can have when we're not as confident in our work. And still, even when you are, they can still pop up. And so my senior thesis in university was actually a series of self-portraits that I did that interacted with photographs that I painted from my family history. Um, my, I am actually uh, 16 years younger and 11 years younger than my sister and brother, respectively. So there's this, this gap in my family, and I was trying to tell that story of the family I saw of them growing up before I was born, and then me, and how I fit in. And I really loved that conversation, but I felt limited in my skill to really achieve the effects that I wanted to in likeness. And, and so I was really proud of that project. I felt kind of stuck. And then once I didn't have the structure of university and I started teaching art, high school art, I missed having that peer group as well as the professors to give me perspective and ideas and kind of push me to really think about what I wanted to say with my art. And I saw a significant drop in skill, actually, for the kind of three to five years after I left school. And part of it was because I was floundering with what do I want to say and does my work actually have any voice or style? And it took probably these past... 10, 10 years or so before I've really found something that feels like it's my voice. And I feel like when people see my work, they might think, oh, that's Carrie's. So it's, it's taken every artwork I've made up to this point to figure it all out. And that meant I stopped along the way and I started drawing mandalas and I made a coloring book from them. And then I started embroidering them. And so I have a series of mandalas that are embroidered And then I started painting them. And then I was living in the Middle East and was thinking about gold leaf and embellishment because of the mosques that I kept visiting. And I started incorporating that into my mandalas. And then the next thing I knew, I was trying to paint famous women like Frida Kahlo and Amelia Earhart. I felt like I wanted to return to this portraiture and celebrate women specifically. 
And while I was looking for royalty-free photos to work from for photo reference, I know that there's you know fair use, fair use copyright, but I think we all get a little nervous about you know what images we can use, especially for famous figures in our work. Yeah. And I was fooling around kind of on the U.S. National Archives looking for photos and image references of these famous women when I stumbled upon a group of photographs of women from the 40s who were gleaming and smiling and just so proud. And I was kind of looking into it a bit more. And they were all women who were choosing to take on careers that were typically for men, but all the men were at war. And it was these photographs of these women training to become cabbies, and a few of them were journalists. And as soon as I saw their faces, I didn't want to paint Amelia or Frida or any of those other famous women anymore. I wanted to paint them. And that's actually the current body of work that I'm I'm in finishing up. I have a solo show in November of 2019 for this body of art that I'm calling Anonymous Woman. And in that series, that's kind of when I found the voice. I found the idea that I was really passionate about that kind of drives the decision and, and the kind of the composition and my use of material. And I combined specifically my love of embroidery and gold leaf with my acrylic paint. I really liked the idea of mixing all these materials. And I'd been wondering about how to incorporate embroidery into my art. And then I loved that other layer of using materials that are typically labeled as craft or more female to discuss this topic of these kind of unknown anonymous women. Um, a piece of that puzzle that I forgot to mention when I was talking about stumbling on these photos is they were all labeled by their profession, but not a single one was given their name. So they were important enough to document in history and to share in this kind of big moment of changing gender roles, but not a single one of these women actually had their name as part of the documentation. And so that's part of the whole story here and why I call it Anonymous Woman. And as I finish each piece, I name them. Yeah, I was actually um, reading that on your website earlier on, and it's fascinating, actually. And yeah, you're right, they do deserve to be named, uh, or at least, I don't know, immortalised somehow. I think um, it's such a shame, isn't it, that that's how things were back then. But where do your initial ideas come from? And, and what's your process from that point? To the finished piece after you've decided what you're going to paint or embroider? Once I have the idea, I kind of play with the image reference. So I'll do small, I'll cut up kind of small pieces of Bristol board or paper. I don't like working in sketchbooks because for some reason I feel like every page has to be pretty and I feel a lot of pressure and I need to have scrap paper so I feel permission to explore and make bad art, so to speak. And oh. so I'll plan and play with composition and ideas. And once I find a composition I like using that photo reference, I will think about putting it in a larger scale on a canvas. And I very consciously don't choose ahead of time where I'm placing gold leaf or what I'll be embroidering into. I had a professor in university who told me I murder my paintings and it sounds absolutely terrible, but now I actually see what she means. And it's this constant desire to overwork and tweak a piece that, that can make it really tight. And so yeah. to avoid murdering my paintings, uh, I, I don't plan the whole artwork out. So as I work on the piece, I'll decide certain things as I go along. And then it sounds a little silly, but especially with these portraits of these women, I essentially kind of ask them, well, what do you think? What, what would you like next? What colors do you see yourself in? And it's just this internal kind of questioning so that I can check in with my intuition and really see what do I think would be a good choice for the work. So I usually lay out the painting once I have the composition decided in a monochrome, usually some kind of umber that I paint in. And oh. then I will begin to add color and then add the embroidery because I have to take the canvas off the frame. I can't keep it on the frame when I stitch, depending on the location of the embroidery design. And so sometimes the embroidery is an entire pattern. Some of the works that I have finished, I looked at fabric designs and wallpaper designs from the 40s and decided to use those either as the background of the painting or in part of the fabric of their coat, for example. So it really depends on each woman. And then the gold leaf comes in 
And after I have everything restretched, well, so I restretch the canvas, I add the gold leaf, and then I will look at kind of finishing touches for painting. Because once I add that embroidery and gold leaf, it can really impact the way you see the colors in the painting. So I don't like to finish the painting part until I have all of that piece finished. They sound like they're a real labor of love. They must take you hours, do they? Or days? <laughs> I love them so much, uh, but one of them, the embroidery in the background of uh, my woman named Barbara, it took over 200 hours just for the embroidery. Oh, wow. I can't sit there for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tara, you're a two-minute yeah, person, I aren't you? <laughs> I, I, I go, you know, a lot more of, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sketch murderer that's what I am <laughs> and I can really relate to what you say about tweaking and tweaking and it's just the worst idea with a sketch but yeah that's that's uh actually, actually that's that's what I'm question, of. about sketching so are you a sketcher as well as a painter do, do you like going out sketching recording things I try to but it makes me very uncomfortable but that's actually why I keep trying so I don't I don't always get to go to my local Urban Sketchers events, but I try to uh, go to at least one or two a year. And I try to bring a sketchbook if I'm traveling so that I can do some doodling and drawing in public because I know my background's in art education as well. So I, I see the benefits of doing things outside of your comfort zone and stretching yourself. I know that that helps you grow your skill. So I need to I need yeah. show up and do that if I'm actually asking my students to do that too. <laughs> Um, and presumably when you do that, you are just taking a sketchbook and a pen, right? Yeah. Not not your stitching. Yeah, and your... yeah no, I, I, <laughs> the stitching is such a slow process. I have sometimes tried to go back into a sketch and stitch into it, but I've never quite finished uh, one yet. It's something that I'm still yeah. thinking it's on the back burner. That might, that might yeah. be part of a future yeah. project. Now, you were a, an art teacher in school, right? Yeah. So, so what made you switch to teaching online as opposed to teaching in a school? I, so when I graduated from university, I initially thought I was going to go get my master's, my MFA in art, and I applied and was accepted kind of provisionally to Art Institute of Chicago. But they said I'd need a year of, I forgot what they called it, but it was this like transitional year where I just had to work on my skill set because I didn't go to a traditional art school. There wasn't any kind of foundational instruction. It was like, it was expected you had some knowledge and they'd teach you technique, but whatever skill set you had that they assumed that's kind of all you had. So I was initially going to do that. And then the cost of that school was so prohibitive uh, that I decided to take a time out and decide if I really wanted an MFA later. So I started looking for jobs and I came across this opportunity to be an intern at a high school on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And the school itself is uh, based, it's a program called International Baccalaureate and it's used in a lot of international schools. So I immediately got trained in this IB program, which let me travel the world. So I got another post in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. And while I was over there, I started to feel this whisper or this question, inner questioning that I'm not doing enough or I'm not reaching enough people. And so many of the parents I'd speak with at parent-teacher conferences would share personal stories of I mean, essentially kind of mild trauma of people telling them that their creativity or art wasn't good enough or that they couldn't draw and, and kind of sharing that fear or experience because they're worried about their kids' experience in the program. And it started to make me think, we need to talk about this on a larger scale. So I started blogging for fun. And as I started blogging, I realized people were doing this kind of thing online and earning money from it. So this little bell kind of went off in the back of my mind, like, oh, could I do that? But I just kept blogging and trying to reach more people and connect with other people who are interested in talking about the arts and education. And I had an opportunity to apply to become assistant principal of the high school. Uh, while I was in Dubai, I also studied online for my own master's degree in educational leadership. So I was kind of perfectly set up to apply for that role. And I thought, well, maybe this is the leadership that I'm looking for. So I was very fortunate and I was accepted for the position. I took it and I learned so much from that job, but I was so sick and so tired and so stressed from it. I knew that it wasn't actually what I should be doing. They're just, for me, it's, it's all about alignment. And I feel like if my body's shutting down on me because of the stress of this job, maybe this actually isn't the job for me. I'm sitting in the principal's office one day because we're dealing with a really tough discipline issue. 
and I looked at him and I said, I would never quit my job. I don't, I signed up for this and I'm, I'm here a hundred percent, but sometimes I wish this was taken out of my hands. And no joke, two hours later, I had a phone call from my then fiance. He never called me at work to say that he had a job offer to be transferred to Muscat Oman. And immediately I felt this lift in my shoulders and I thought, this is it. I'm supposed to focus on my blog. So uh, we got married that summer. We ended up moving to Muscat Oman. And that's when I began teaching online and started my community called Artist Strong. So was the blog, was that called Artist Strong as well? Initially, it was actually called Artist Think. And I changed the name kind of shortly after I started the business. So I didn't, you know, I don't see the blogging as the business. I really see myself kind of maybe a year into living in Muscat that I really took ownership of treating artists strong as a business. And I was looking at trademarking and things and realized that that I couldn't trademark artists think. And I decided I should really think about renaming the community. And at that point, too, I had a larger audience following my blog. And I was offering a lot of free webinars where I just taught different art techniques. And so people had been starting to sign up and join the community. And I let them help me name name the community and the business. So I told them that I had to change the name. And I was worried that that would mean all of a sudden they wouldn't trust me anymore or they'd disappear. But in fact, it actually was this rallying point for for Artists Strong. And I had so many people enthusiastic and on board about trying to figure out what we should call ourselves. And Artist Strong came from an email from someone in the community that said, you make me feel artist strong. And by the community, you're talking about in your Facebook group, aren't you? Yeah, um, because yeah, actually, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I didn't start with a Facebook group. That came later. So that was ah. um, just from my email list, my newsletter, and yeah. then yeah. Um, the free webinars that I was doing. Because I know that Tara and I, uh, although we are basically a duo doing what we do, I mean, you really do feel like you've got a, a real bunch of lovely people behind you. Isn't that right, Tara? Yeah, I know. Look, yeah. Our, um, I mean, and especially in our Facebook group as well. I mean, we're always getting such lovely um, feedback and encouragement. And, and we often ask, you know, what do you want us to talk about? Or, you know, have you have any of you got any ideas for challenges? And it's a lovely thing. Exactly. And, and that's why yeah. I do, uh, even though it is a business, I always frame it in terms of community. I'm making decisions because of the people mm-hmm. I serve and because that's why I'm here. I felt this call to reach more people. And here I am having this chance. A classroom of 25 students isn't the same as 3,000 people or now the 2K that I have in the Facebook group. And to see how many adults are seeing shifts in their life and their feelings of self-worth because they're finally letting themselves be creative, something they've always wanted to do, but somehow someone somewhere has told them it's not enough. I I really don't think I could be doing anything more valuable. And and it really is, like you guys say, like the, seeing the wins and seeing the enthusiasm of the people in the community, I, I create the content for them and if they need something I want to build it well we couldn't do it without any of them that's for sure exactly I don't know if you find it but we find in our group as well as well as them learning things obviously you know from each other and, and we do little things but they also loads of them said they've got things out of it for their well-being so people have said it's changed their lives just you know creating art every day Yeah, exactly. That's the big thing I didn't quite anticipate as I started doing it. But the more people that showed up, the more they were like, I'm less stressed. I feel like I'm nicer to my family because I'm actually taking some time for myself. It's helping me manage with pain for people with disability. It's helping people who are grieving have kind of a way to channel some of their grief. I've just heard so many positive results from choosing to follow their creative interests. So how do you go about balancing creating your own art along with teaching other people? <laughs> that's that's the question, isn't it? So for the longest time, I'd neglected my art. I always then made art for examples for student lessons, and I'd kind of dabble or doodle on the side. So I wouldn't say it was until, well, while I was teaching, I actually used vacation time to make art. So I wouldn't travel the way that a lot of international teachers do. I would actually spend several of my vacation time staying home painting. And then when I moved online, it felt like I needed to spend all my time online to really support everyone. So initially, I consciously let my art take a back seat. About 
probably five years ago now, I started to have this, this inkling of wanting to do more art or say something with my work. And that's, that's when I started doing the embroidery where I was just trying to kind of detox from the previous, the stress of the previous job of being assistant principal. And embroidery for me is so stress relieving because it's mindless. It's this repetitive, mindful action and you see immediate results. And I really find that satisfying. And that's, that's kind of led me to finding the series that I'm working on. And once I had the series, I actually, I had the idea and then I kind of put it to the side. I started some of the works, but I didn't finish them and I didn't kind of fully commit. And I talked to a friend through Skype and she, she's like, Carrie, why aren't you doing something with these? Like these should be in a gallery. Galleries would like this work. And I was like, you know what, Nikki, you're right. I, I really need to step up. And that was the little kind of kick in the pants I needed to uh, uh, move forward and start committing to my work. So in the past year and a half, I'd say I'm really trying to shift so that half my day is studio and half my day is working with the community. Now, some people believe that being artistic is something that you're either born with um, or you're not. So would you agree with that or do you think that anyone can learn? This topic makes me want to bang my head against a cement wall because sometimes it feels <laughs> like I just can't. The people who, who believe that talent is uh, something you're born with aren't receptive to hearing otherwise. But I can, I can assuredly say that is complete bunk. You have to have an interest to dedicate time to something. So maybe we have an innate inclination towards a subject matter or something we like to do. But there is overwhelming research and evidence that shows that we can build our skill in any discipline if we know how to do it and we're committed to doing it. I think it's about wanting, it's how much you want something, isn't it? Rather than... Yeah, absolutely. It's also if someone encourages you, I think that pushes you on, doesn't it? Absolutely. When you have the environment where people support and encourage you in something you care about, you're going to get better at it and you're going to want to keep trying because you're getting affirmation that you're doing something that people like. A great book that discusses this is Peak by Anders Ericsson. He spent 30 years researching the science of expertise and what made people experts in their fields. And he interviewed musicians, artists, professional sports people, Olympians, you name it. And basically he found this formula that everyone uses to build their skill and become expert. And while I don't think everyone has to become expert and that doesn't need to be everyone's goal, if those are the tools that people use to become the best of the best in their field, why can't we actually apply these to art, for example? So I actually use them to create, I have a free challenge called drawing drills and I outline and describe them in that. So for someone who does want to improve their drawing or painting, what tips would you give them? So the first thing you need to think about is actually what do you mean by improving your skill? Because a lot of people will say, I can't draw. And what I think they're really saying is I can't draw realistically. And that's very different because you can draw and express yourself without having to, you know, completely reference a photograph or make something photorealistic. So knowing specifically what we want and actually owning that is step one. Once we know our goal, say, for example, you want to draw realistic faces, well, then you have to show up and start trying to draw them. And you have to figure out what you're doing right and wrong. You need to study different techniques and, and uses of the medium that you're working in. So if you're using pencil, how can you achieve different effects with your pencil? And ultimately, you really have to have feedback as well. You need feedback from peers who are working alongside you, who might help you spot things you can't see yourself. And you need mentors who are maybe a just a little bit ahead of you who can help you figure out what to practice or work on next. We can't see everything when we just start something new. We have to train our eyes to see all those details. So what do you find to be the most common things that your students need help with? Well, um, often it's mindset, uh, which surprised me a little bit too, mm. because I sincerely believe and know that people can, anyone can learn technique. I'm noticing that a lot of people feel they can't or they have mindset issues around, for example, the label self-taught and they feel like that means that there's a gap in their art education so that they're not good enough and therefore they'll never be good enough. They also have this, this story of the myth of talent that so many people communicate that makes them feel like, well, what's the point of trying harder if I can never, you know, I'm going to plateau and be stuck where I am. 
So I find having a lot of conversation around how to practice, it's a called deliberate practice in that book called Peak um, that he suggests you do. And I talk a lot about that. I talk about the myth of talent and stories that I have that kind of help dispel the myth and also just help people feel permission to make time for their art because so many of them, so many people in my community specifically are women. And because they spend a lot of their lives as caregivers or people kind of taking care of their home and family, they feel like they that always has to come first. And when they make time for their art before that, even though society kind of puts down art as this cute little thing to do and, and watching Netflix is somehow better than, you know, making art if you're not going to sell it or be professional with it somehow, that you know, what is that? What are they saying about how they value their family? So I do, I see a lot of issues around guilt for making time for art, finding time, feeling justified for the time that they give themselves, and even giving themselves money to, to put towards it, even though, you know, their partners might be golfing, which is an expensive activity, and no one questions that desire. Can I just quickly circle back to what you were saying before about people, you know, it's whether they want to they can draw or draw realistically and that's where their problem is. They just think that because they can't necessarily draw realistically, it means they can't draw. And it's funny you should say that because um, my husband's auntie, uh, her, my, his auntie Jean, now she decided she wanted to go to a little art class, which she started doing. And uh, she she drew this coffee pot. I think it was just with a stick of charcoal. And she said, <laughs> she said I think it, she said something along the lines of, well, I, clearly I can't draw, it's rubbish. But do you know what? That It was one of those drawings that had so much character. I absolutely loved it. And if I had that drawing, I would have put it on my wall because... It's, it just, it wasn't sort of laboured. There was something about it that was just charming without all that labour behind it. And I think anyone listening who thinks they can't draw because they can't draw realistically, sometimes that's not a bad thing. You can express yourself without having to feel like, you you, you know, you can't draw. You can express yourself in any way you like on paper and you are drawing. Exactly. Amen. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I've busted in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's such a good point. And that's something I constantly see with my students and people in the community is they'll post art and they'll, they'll post it, but kind of with this hedge, this like excuse for the work, because it's clearly not good enough in their mind, even though it's totally fine. And there's been some beautiful, beautiful works that I'm like, you guys, you could just hang this by itself. This is a beautiful drawing, but because it's not what they intended or thought they should be able to do, they only see it and frame it as a failure. And I mean, there's a lot of failing in art if you really do want to make it part of your life. I, I applied to kind of 40 different opportunities before I found the right gallery for a solo show for my current work. So if you really want art to be part of your life, failing is something to celebrate, not to avoid. But, you know, we need to we need to kind of reframe the way we look at making. And and like you said, there, there can be such beautiful quality and character to work where you lose that goal of having to be realistic. I think you always want what you haven't got as well, don't you? Because I know I always wish I could be a little bit more tidy in my drawing. And uh, Sandra, you always want to draw more loosely, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could be a bit more messy. Mind you, I'm learning as as we do this this whole thing. I'm having to experiment a lot more and also accept, you know, that things don't have to be perfect. You know, it's just something, it's part of the journey. I think a failure, I don't even agree that there should be such a word in art, really. I'd rather have 12 failed attempts than no attempts at all, because then you've got something on paper, you've done something. And the great irony is people avoid trying things because they're afraid of failure, but that's failing because they're, they're stuck exactly where they are, which is what they don't want to be. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've failed loads of times. We, Tara, you've failed loads of times. We've all done it, but it, it is. Speak you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know we, we've all done things that we think, oh, that was just awful. But I'll tell you what, you always learn from it and you always do better the next time. So you have to, you know, embrace those failures, I think. The first time I rode a bike, I'm pretty sure I fell down quite a few times. And yet for some yeah. reason with art, when we try, and especially as adults, I think it's not just art, it's anything new. We somehow want to try something and then immediately be good at it. And if we're not, that means something's wrong with us. It's this kind of personal valuation. And I, 
it's just not how it works. And as kids, we don't think about it because we just are constantly exploring and trying and messing up. And it's something that's just naturally part of our life as a child. And yet somehow we don't give ourselves permission to do that as adults. And when we stop as children and then we start again as adults, you know, it's it's hard to accept the fact that when you start again, you are starting from where you left off. So, you know, you might draw an apple that looks like an eight-year-old's drawn it. Well, that's fine because you were probably eight the last time you drew an apple. Exactly. But then, you know, it's surprising how quickly you can, you know, you'll get better and better. Um, it's surprising how quickly that happens if you put in that active learning you know, the actual practice and, and putting in the time. Mm-hmm. And and being mindful of, of what we're looking for, you know, not just in terms of a bigger goal, like I want to draw realistic faces, but as you say, mm-hmm. when we're practicing, sometimes people sketch without really being in tune with what they're doing. And if we can actually be really mindful and in the moment, kind of a meditation practice where you're really paying attention to your marks and just kind of enjoying that experience, that's when you're actually going to see big shifts too, because you're really, you know, you're focused on the task at hand and not kind of somewhere else. Yeah. I just want to go back to when you were saying before about people giving themselves permission to spend time making their art. So have you actually got any tips for people who want to build a creative habit and build that art into their day? A few things come to mind. One of the biggest wins I've seen people have repeatedly is making a small commitment of 15 minutes a day. I got this idea from Samantha Bennett And I can't think of the name of her book right now, but I'll make sure you guys have it so you can link it in the show notes. And she, it's called something about like organized creatives. And she basically said, show up for 15 minutes a day and you'll, you'll think that you can't possibly get anything done in that time. And yet by showing up every day, people are astounded by how much they create. And then what what happens to many is all of a sudden they've done 15 minutes a day for a month. And now all of a sudden they realize that they've been working for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, and they don't even realize they've actually found this more time by just making the commitment to show up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this is a lot of the challenges we do. We make them just that short, really, don't we, Tara? Just for that reason, to to make sure people don't, yeah, some some even five minutes, you know, and quite often you feel like, you know, you, you, go on for longer without even realizing so that's a really good tip do you um find carrie that you're inspired by other artists and do you have any favorites in particular i love abstract expressionist work and it's funny because almost all my work is realistic but there's something about mark rothko that i love seeing his work in person was just wonderful for me the the staining and richness of the his color choices i'm really mm. really drawn to his work and the kind of emotional quality of the paint there's something when you stand in front of those paintings that you really feel emotion coming off of the canvas and i i just love that use of color the other kind of contemporary artists I've been looking at. There's a woman on Instagram. Her name is Ashley Longshore. She's very irreverent and often vulgar. So you're forewarned if you go look her up, but I love her. She's hilarious. She just owns who she is. She does portraits of people and she blings them up quite a bit. She'll use beads and things and she is self-taught. So I also like that she's this self-starter and an example to people that you don't have to go to art school to be a thriving artist. And another Instagram person I really like, her name is CJ Henry, and she draws photo, like hyper photo realistic work at a very large scale. And she's currently been doing some installation work as well. And I, I, yeah, both of them, I love seeing their work on Instagram. I'm, they make me feel like I have some kind of standard to push myself towards and, and just seeing these women artists today thriving and and making it happen for themselves is a wonderful example for all of us. And that's quite an eclectic mix, isn't it, from Rothko to, um, you know, (laughs) hyper-realism. So you're obviously inspired by a a whole load of genres, really. I think that, again, goes back to my mom. Thanks, Jill Brummer. Uh, You know, she did show me that you can find those connections and joy in all kinds of different media. And and I do, I think, you know, Rothko's use of colour is is something that I'm very conscious about, trying to use colours that... are aligned with my final goal for the work yet you know for me personally if I could 
step up my level of realism in my paintings. I think that'd be really, really fun. Have you ever tried an abstract painting just for fun? I have, and I'm always mortified by them. But again, <laughs> it's because I, I am not as familiar with strategies of practice and, and playing because I haven't given myself time. So it is something I'm wondering after this show is done and I have all this work made, I want to give myself a couple months where I don't have any goals, but I make art a lot and just kind of let myself play. And I'm wondering if that might be one of the, the investigations I need to give myself time for. So have you ever experienced artist block? And if so, how do you overcome it? I fall into artist block when I take too long of a break between making. So it's not like I am in the middle of making and all of a sudden can't make anymore. It's I'm in between projects and I don't really know what to do next. And then I just let life and other things kind of get in the way. And all of a sudden it's been months and and then I start to get nervous. Well, can I still do this? Have I forgotten all of my skill? Like, what if I can't do this anymore? And that kind of pestering question gets in the way of me showing up for my art and can make make me take a lot longer to get started again than is necessary. I so totally relate to what you've just said. That's just me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I always seem to have a block between paintings and it's just, I think it is, half of it's the fear of, oh, will that one will this one succeed like the last one did? Or what if it goes wrong? It's, you know, and I've been painting now for years and I still get that. So it's interesting, isn't it? And I remember in a previous episode, um, we were talking about sketching and filling a sketchbook. And um, there's a little time period of about three weeks where I did not sketch in my sketchbook when I've been doing it every day for the best part of a year. And it was basically after a sketch that I did that just was awful. I mean, it was so bad. <laughs> And sure enough, three weeks later, I hadn't drawn a thing. And it took me, you know, it took me ages to kind of put the, my pencil to paper again. And the next one was absolutely fine. But it is, it's a fear, isn't it? I think I think that is actually a lot of what artist block can be about. It's more of a, a fear than a actually not knowing what to to do. Yeah, I think the fear fuels us to stay stuck. And then you start to mm. second guess things. So something I am doing now, I used to have this notion I don't know why when I was younger that I had to finish a painting one at a time almost like I had to read a book one at a time like you couldn't read multiple books at a time you had to read one beginning to end and then start a new one and I, I applied yeah. that idea to my art and all of a sudden it occurred to me what if I had lots of work going on at the same time one I'm going to have a lot more done in terms of my production but two having a bunch of different works in different states of completion it helps me jump around so that I kind of always have something I could work on. So there are fewer gaps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't tell me you can read two books at a time. Though. <laughs> if, <laughs> if one is nonfiction and one is fiction, I can. I can't do two Fair fiction enough. at the same time. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> um, so you have exhibited your work, haven't you, in galleries before? Um, and you're currently working on this solo exhibition exhibition so when is that going to be and is it going to be um an exhibition of lots of different types of your work or is it one specific type so i have done a lot of group exhibitions from kind of my early 20s forward and this is my very first solo exhibition coming in november it's going to be um, end of november the opening is actually december 1st of 2019 and it's at the shankman arts center in ottawa canada and the show specifically, it's through the city. So they have city-wide gall city-owned galleries here, and you can apply to see if they feel your work is a good fit for show. And they liked my anonymous woman idea and project. So all the work will be around that series. I am creating work with different sizes and scale and different use of materials. So I've got some really large scale portraits. I have some that are smaller. If I have enough time, we'll see. I would really like to do some that are just embroidered portraits, but that moves a lot more slowly. So we'll have to see how many paintings I get done first. Uh, but it is all on that subject matter. I saw you show one of your sketches today that you'd done, yeah. um, one, one of the women. Um, are you going to show those as well, the exhibition? I didn't know if you'd show your progress work. I am. Actually, that's a great story because my friend, that friend Nikki that I mentioned, who kind of gave me the kick in the butt to say, come on, let's do something with this work. She was looking at the drawings and I was just treating them like these little practice studies. And she's like, Carrie, why wouldn't you 
show these too. People would love these. I was like, really? Oh, okay. So I've mounted all of those on canvas. So they're ready to hang and uh, display. So they, they'll, they'll be part of the show. Oh, I think that's such a nice thing to do. Um, I know for, well, certainly for me, when I've been to exhibitions before and they've um, shown their actual sketchbooks, it's been you know, equally as lovely to see as the actual paintings. And I went to a, a Turner exhibition and um, he had obviously lots of his famous paintings up. And in the centre of the room, there was this glass case and in it there was things like his wallet, which was covered in painty fingerprints <laughs> and his palette and things like that. But also his scraps of um, his sketches and his scraps of paper with scribbles on. And there was something about those that was you almost felt like you were seeing more of the artist than in the actual painting, you know, the finished painting. So I, I love sketches. I think I, I enjoy looking through sketchbooks, I think, almost more than looking at finished work. So great idea to include them. Yeah, there's there's something, again, to give ourselves permission to show journey and, and you know, just having it pointed out by a friend, too. Sometimes we need someone outside of ourselves to see it, but that our sketches can be beautiful and worth hanging and buying and selling if that's something we want to do with them. Mm. So as well as the exhibition, what other hopes and plans have you got for the future? I am working on something that I'm going to launch in tandem with the show. I want to have... I don't know what to call it yet, but I'm going to basically have a limited edition physical product that is related to this group of women. And I'm going to put my hand in it in some way. So for example, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of, for example, like a little makeup bag that has a print of one of my women on it. And then I'll embroider into the handbag, or the little makeup bag. And I'd have maybe 20 at most. And I was thinking about making four different groupings of this to kind of launch and it'd be a year commitment for people who would like to have little little goodies mailed to them maybe four times a year um, of these kind of one of a kind hand touched kind of I don't know, I, like little totes maybe, or, um, you know, some kind of sketchbook cover that has real gold leaf on it, little bits that, that tie to these women and their story to kind of get their faces out there more. I love that idea. So where can people find out a bit more about you and of course, Artist Strong? Sure. So if you want to see more of my art or hear more of my stories around my art, you can go to carriebrummer.com. And if you're interested in my art education platform in the community, it's called artiststrong.com. And you can always just see me over on Instagram at artiststrong as well. Can I just ask you about Artist Strong? What, what are you teaching over there that people might be interested in? Sure. So I actually have two free mini challenges or courses that people can sign up for at any time. One is called Drawing Drills, and it outlines a formula you can use to practice to develop your drawing skill. And then the other one is called ten, Soul, Brush, Soul Brush Sessions. Say that three times fast. 10 Days to a Unique Artwork. And it's got a little prompt every day to help you just spend a little bit of time every day working towards an artwork over those 10 days. So those are both free and you can find them on the website. And then in terms of paid programs, I have a course that actually just started today, as of our recording anyways. It's called Self-Taught to Self-Confident. It's uncovering the foundational drawing skills to help improve all of your art. And I have a six-month mastermind program called The Circle, which is to help artists show up more regularly for their art and find their voice. Well, Carrie, it's been so nice to talk to you, and I'm sure you've inspired um, so many people. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us. Ladies, anytime. I love chatting with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Take care then. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, perhaps you'd like to share it and leave a review for us on iTunes. 